All right, everyone, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm so excited to have Dr. Jordan here to talk to us about climate change and river herring. Um, but I will let him introduce himself in just a moment and thought I would walk through a couple of um, Zoom kind of housekeeping things before we start. So if you've never been on a Zoom webinar, um, in this format, all the videos are turned off for anyone who is not a presenter. I'll be turning mine off momentarily. Um, so you will just be able to see the, um, the presentation during this rather than all of the videos you might see in a meeting. Additionally, if you look at the toolbar, you'll see a Q&A box. And this is a great place for you to type in any questions so that they don't get lost in the chat function. And um, we will be saving those for the end, um, but you can go ahead and type them in so that you don't forget them or lose your train of thought. There's also a chat function. So throughout the presentation, if you have a question about Zoom or something isn't working for you, um, feel free to type that into the chat box as well. So just to test this out, why doesn't uh, everyone find the chat box? and just put the town that you are watching from. I'm gonna type this in here. I'm from Medford. Awesome, so I see we're all getting the hang of it, perfect. Great, lots of Winchester, Medford, Somerville folks, Arlington. Wonderful, thank you all for, for doing that. I also see there are already some questions in the Q&A. One is relevant. We will be recording this. So if you want to watch it again, I'll send that out. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Jordan. I just want to express my gratitude for being here. Thank you. Thank you, um, Erica. Just nod quickly if you can hear me. All right, great. Thank you. Um, and thank you everybody for joining. Um, this has been a bit of a challenge to schedule. We're experiencing unprecedented um, upheaval in our country, um, both from the pandemic and then from the social justice issues that um, have been really um, to the forefront. So we've been trying to uh, organize this around all of those complex things. And so while um, all that's going on, I would like to spend the next probably not quite hour, um, I guess it depends on how long-winded I am, um, sort of leaving that behind and just thinking about river herring um, and climate change. I like to think that we, I'm often asked if I'm an expert on river herring and I like to respond to that, that we don't really know enough about river herring to claim that anybody's ex an expert in my opinion. Um, they're a really um, elusive species considering how important they are to folks and I hope that that's an element of what comes out of this is that we still have a lot of work to do understanding what's going on with them as we do in understanding the impacts of climate change. And so this is really, um, you know, I'm going to walk through a lot of examples and sort of placing it in the, in the perspective of how you might um, experience these things into the future in the Mystic River watershed. Um, but, um, you know, the future is, is written by, um, by people's actions in the future. And so a lot of what we do now will uh, will have an impact on how river herring uh, populations uh, do in the future. So with that, um, my name is Adrian Jordan. I'm an associate professor at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I arrived here in 2012 and I had started working on river herring um, really because I ran into them while I was doing estuary sampling in Acadia National Park and sort of became mesmerized by how how many dams there were across the landscape and how they were likely impacting river herring populations. And so that was really my first foray into, their, into, the, into the world of the river herring. And, um, and then I went to Stony Brook and then to UMass. And, and in, in all cases, you know, I've, I've continued working on this species um, that I have uh, quite a passion for and, and really think are sort of a sentinel for, for how to have a productive ecosystem that crosses the freshwater and ocean boundaries. Um, and so I, I really, I'm really passionate about them. However, I don't work by myself. And so the first thing I'm going to do is recognize um, the rest of my river herring team, which is not a small group of people. Um, so first is um, Dr. Allison Roy and Dr. Michelle Stoginger at uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst. 
uh, both also federal employees with the USGS, um, but uh, one in the co-op unit and the other one at the Climate Science Center. So both Michelle and, and Allison are great co colleagues of mine. I, I work with them um, extensively on these species. But I also work with, um, with other faculty across uh, University of Connecticut, um, University of Montana, um, as well as other USGS federal and state partners. And in particular, I'd like to uh, note the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, uh, Benga Hagen, and uh, Mike Armstrong and others um, who I have a great relationship with and who I would not be doing this work with, without, um, without, their, um, without their help. Um, we've also received funding from the Nature Conservancy, um, the Division of Marine Fisheries, um, National Fish and, uh, Fish and Wildlife Foundation, Lenfest Ocean Program, Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, and most recently, um, the uh, Woods Hole Sea Grant, which I'll touch on a little bit later to really do some work on, uh, on the estuary. Um, we train a large group of undergraduate students um, in techniques related to fisheries. And um, this year, our 2020 team is listed at the bottom. Obviously, they're dealing with incredible challenges because we are still, at this point, um, not doing any field work. Um, and we're trying to plan for, for that safely in the future. And then the last thing I'd like to point out is that um, almost all of the actual science that's done in this work has been done by uh, graduate students who are listed there, Julianne, Magna, Stephen, Matt, um, Bia, Leon, Becky Dalton, and, uh, and Henry. Um, all of those have uh, contributed to what I'm gonna say today, their conversations and, um, and manuscripts have driven what I think and how I view these problems. And um, they're really important and critical parts of this. Um, and so hopefully I do their work justice as I touch upon it um, throughout this talk. So it's kind of going to be in four parts. I'm going to admit that it's going to slowly meander a little bit across these uh, sections. I'll try to point out when we've made uh, made a shift. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping to really leave some of the where do we go from here part to uh, questions as, as well. So I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time sort of espousing what I think are the future. One of the key points I'd like to get out of this talk is that every location is different. Every population of river herring is different and probably what we're gonna have to do in each of their circumstances um, is gonna be different. So a while ago, I was asked to be on a panel that discussed, uh, discussed the, um, the results of this uh, special report by the IPCC on climate change. And so I thought that was a great place to start just putting this into a global context. So there are two general issues with climate change uh, when it comes to marine um, and ocean, ocean estuary organisms. And, and those are, first of all, the increasing air temperature, sea surface temperature, the number of heat days, which is the third panel down, which are just defined by extreme heat. Um, and, then, um, and then just the, the general capacity of the ocean just um, bringing on this heat. So obviously as that occurs, the glaciers melt, which, and the ice sheets melt, which contributes to climate change. But the other thing is that, it, and everybody knows this, if you make a cup of coffee in the morning, um, water also expands. If you have a full pot as you start, it'll overflow by the time it's gotten hot. And that's because ocean water will also expand, it also, ocean water will also expand under, these, under this heating. And so sea level rise will, will also be an important part of the story with coastal, um, coastal areas and ecosystems. And uh, I just think it's uh, worth pointing out and I'll try and point it out later on in the talk. I guess if there's good news out of this, um, it would be that we're not expected to see huge change in terms of the primary production, which is the amount of phytoplankton in the oceans, the amount of biomass of animals and the amount of fisheries catch in our region. However, um, and I'm not going to talk about this too much today, other than to mention that there is going to be a great inequality in terms of the global impacts of climate change, and it's going to be borne by the most uh, challenged countries currently, and this is just something to bear in mind. There are a lot of habitats that are going to be impacted. The three key habitats for us today are going to be epipelagic, which is sort of the surface waters, the top 200 meters of the ocean, salt marshes, and estuaries. These are not anywhere near as vulnerable as the warm water corals, um, but they're, all of these can be impacted um, by climate change and as reported in this, uh, in this uh, report, are impacted at different levels at different times. 
And this is just something that's going to have to be watched over time through monitoring programs to really truly understand uh, what these overall impacts are going to be in terms of the delivery of what we call ecosystem services, such as fisheries or tourism that, um, that our coastal communities depend upon. So that's climate change in like three slides, which obviously doesn't uh, do it any justice. But I, I just to summarize quickly that we know more water is getting warmer, the air is getting warmer, we're experiencing more heat waves, we're experiencing increasing sea level, and that the habitat is under threat from multiple factors. And then there are other impacts, which I'm not going to talk about, which include ocean acidification as well. And we don't really understand um, how those could or might impact river herring in the future. So let's bring it down to the, to the Mystic River watershed. Um, here's a map um, just showing the, the area with the, the two um, Mystic, Liver, uh, Mystic River lakes, um, as well as uh, Horn Pond, which has recently got uh, river herring. So I'm going to just go through some of the things that, um, that are going to be experienced in the region. Um, the first is that the Gulf of Maine, which is the receiving end of this, and I'd like to thank Michelle Stockinger for uh, these, slide, these couple of next slides. Um, is getting warmer and it's getting warmer at a rate that is faster than the global oceans. And so we are going to see impacts from, um, from this warming on a seasonal, seasonal system um, that experiences very cold and very warm waters over, over the, over the uh, entire year. Um, it's, going to, it's going to be um, a really dramatic and, and potentially dramatic in ch uh, change in, in that system. And what is occurring with that is that um, the amount of, um, we're getting an earlier onset of summer and a, early, a later onset of winter, which means our, our seasons are expanding for the warm period and contracting for the, for the, for the colder period. If you go to this wonderful um, website uh, that a colleague of ours, Ben Letcher has been uh, leading, EcoSheds, you can actually look at what predicted stream temperatures are going to be uh, within your area. And so I went on and, and grabbed some uh, information for around, um, around the Mystic Lakes. Um, this was really to understand the impacts of water temperatures on brook trout. Um, I guess you'll be happy to know that there's about a 3% chance that there's currently brook trout in the Mystic River watershed. Um, but unfortunately, in the future, in, under any scenario of warming, um, brook trout are not likely to, to do very well in, in the, in, in the uh, Mystic River watershed. Pretty warm watershed by, by, um, by standards of the Northeast. Um, and then I'll just say that I, I want you to sort of bear in mind with a temperature of about 25 degrees. Um, and, and I'll come back to that a little bit later in the talk. So this is expecting about a two degree change in, in, um, in air temperature which is very much on the low end, I think, of what we're going to experience. Um, and obviously, if you increase that by six degrees, which is this next slide, you start seeing these sort of like off green colors that are sort of more in the upper 20 degrees Celsius uh, temperatures. And um, that's, um, that, those are definitely warm waters. They're great for swimming, obviously not great necessarily for any cold water species. Here's the lower part of the system. Same kind of story at about six degree, uh, with a six degree change in air temperature. You see um, warm waters throughout the summer, and these are median um, median temperatures. I'm just realizing right now that I actually forgot to put in our temperature logger data for this site. Um, when you when you actually look at what we've collected on the surface in Mystic Lakes, Mystic Lakes, we often exceed 30 degrees Celsius, or sometimes exceed 30 degrees Celsius. And certainly in much of the summer are between 25 and 30 degrees. So this is the temperature side of it, but the area is also going to change in terms of the, um, the impacts of sea level rise. The Mystic Lakes are not much above sea level and therefore everything below the, those um, the lakes is going to uh, likely experience changes in the way that that wa salt water and fresh water interact with one another. And um, under the worst case scenarios, uh, re really the Mystic Lakes might become the next estuary in, in the region um, much into the future. So I stitched together the whole region in this next slide just to sort of show you the entire area. It's not perfectly stitched together because it was hard to line them all up, but just gives you a sense of like how profound these changes might be in the Boston area and how likely it is that 
there's going to be a response from the government of uh, the city of Boston and surrounding communities to these anticipated changes, especially as they occur. And a sea level change is one thing, but if you start looking at the potential for, um, and it's the same viewer now, a little different viewer for um, from Massachusetts, but these would be the impacts of a hurricane, for example. And so we know that these are vulnerable areas and we're gonna have to do something about it. And that's very likely gonna involve heavy infrastructure in the water to either um, remove the risk or to create a barrier to these potential uh, flooding events. Um, I think that's generally undecided exactly what route we're gonna go. Um, but all places are gonna experience these risks um, associated with hurricanes and just sea level rise in general. And so we expect that both the temperatures are gonna increase, the ocean temperatures are gonna increase, the, the land temperatures are gonna increase, the water on land temperatures are gonna increase. And then the, the, the way that these estuaries are, are, are built and function are also going to change. And we're gonna play a role in how that how that, um, that actually occurs, whether it's through hard armament and, um, and, um, and so forth. And the issue with that um, can be nicely illustrated, I think, looking at some of the areas where there's a lot of marsh. So this is the, the Great Marsh um, and the Parker River Wild, uh, National Wildlife Refuge, huge marsh areas. Um, I encourage you to go and look on that map viewer that I showed, they're, they're gonna be inundated quite significantly. And the question becomes, at, we do have this marsh now, but what happens as the sea level increases? Are we going to create hard boundaries on our towns that essentially lose this salt marsh? Um, this remains an open question. So I think there's lots of, the, the impacts of climate change bring about, bring about lots of questions. What is going to be a habitat? How is it gonna function? And we are gonna play a large role in what happens there. So in, in summary, um, the Mystic River watershed in the future is gonna have longer, hotter summers, shorter, warmer, warmer winters, um, probably heavy spring rain, rains and summer drought, although those predictions are a lot less clear in the future. Um, we know that it's gonna be different in terms of its physical um, area, but we don't know how and what is gonna be done. And it's just really, I think, an area of, um, of difficult, it's very difficult to, to really understand um, how that's gonna look. Um, okay, so what about river herring in this context? So I'm gonna kind of go through this um, in this order, um, both uh, focusing first on phenology and then I'll talk about growth and metabolic costs um, and what, what, we, what we're seeing in our limited work on this. And then I'm gonna ask um, some questions about what, what maybe could be done. So I think everybody, I assume on this call um, is uh, fairly knowledgeable about river, river herring and their life cycle. But I thought it'd be important to just go through this uh, briefly to, um, to make sure everybody understands some of the key terminology I'm gonna use. So the spawning runs occur just a little bit ago, still underway in some parts of New England. Um, kind of an odd year actually, it seemed like it was gonna be very warm very early um, and then got pretty cool for an extra month just to remind us that it was still early in the spring. Um, and then it, it's gotten very dry here, at least for the last little while. And all these things are gonna impact how those adults move into the systems. Then they lay these, um, these semi-demersal, which means uh, mostly on the bottom, um, slightly adhesive eggs. So they'll stick a little bit, but they can float around um, as well and move around a little bit. They have an incubation period, which um, is temperature dependent and important to note that, but it's about nine days um, in Massachusetts spring conditions. And then they'll hatch into what I call a little spaghetti looking larvae. And that little ball that's um, on that spaghetti is its yolk sac. So it uses this yolk sac that's passed on from its egg to um, power its growth in the early part of its life. Then it transitions to feeding on small zooplankton and um, starts its growth into this juvenile phase. And then those um, sometime between the months of June and the next year um, uh, move out to the ocean and stay there for about three to five years and return um, to spawn um, once they hit um, maturity. Um, our work has shown that they will spawn for multiple times in a year and that um, those fish will likely return the following year 
um, and repeat that until they're captured in a fishery, eaten by something, or um, perished by other, other um, means. So I like to think of these as sort of phenological moments. So phenology is the study of life, of repeating cyclical life uh, events. So those can be the migration, the spawning, the hatching of the different life stages um, or migration of the different life stages. We're very fortunate. Um, actually, I have another slide that uh, talks about how um, uh, fish are very difficult to observe in the ocean. Um, we're very lucky though with river herring because they do come through these counting stations, which I'm, I know the Mystic River Watershed Association have played an incredibly important role in collecting this data on the migration. And so we do have this one moment in their lives where we get really high quality data in terms of how many fish are passing through counting stations. And those counting stations can be operated through citizen science, but also through the Division of Marine Fisheries efforts on both electronic and video and uh, vi video counting. So um, there are some other surveys, um, but they're really difficult to detect any trends in terms of the abundance of river herring or where they're going. The counts of the runs give you a pretty good sense of what's going on. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. Um, actually, I might be coming to it right away. Um, so our work in the, with the Mystic River Watershed Association started back in 2014. Um, that was our first year sampling in that system. Um, and you know, it's been a great success story. I don't think you can deny that looking uh, at your own uh, website's data thrown up um, that we that there's been a great success in the Mystic River, moving from a fairly small run to uh, in the couple largest in the state. I forgot to ask Ben if it's if it's number one yet or not, but we we feel like it might get there one day. So amazing what you do when you open habitat and um, make it accessible to these uh, to these fish. So I know many of you probably haven't been able to get out as you would like. So um, I thought we would start with actually looking at the, uh, one of the runs um, underwater. And I was hoping I turned off my volume, but apparently I haven't. So sorry, but it's super loud. Um, I'm not gonna show you data from our work on the spawn run. But we see that it is, um, Henry has shown that it seems to be temperature and flow dependent and a little bit different on um, in different systems. Um, but these certainly, this, the advancement of warm temperatures in the spring seems to be driving the run of, um, of um, fish movements on a daily basis. Um, and I'll let Henry one day give a nice talk to you guys about that, hopefully. Um, in other work we've done, this is uh, Becky Dalton's work uh, looking at, um, at a certain number of systems. And, we were limited by the length of the time series. So at the time that we did this work, um, the, the Mystic River watershed time series wasn't quite long enough um, to be used in this, uh, in this effort. But what we do is we take these rivers and uh, we, extract, uh, we extract what we call phenology metrics. So that would be the initiation and the end and the median, the, so the middle of that run and, and ask, has this been cha uh, getting changed over time? Has this been has this changed over time? So, um, what we see in a nutshell is that the run itself seems to be getting driven in terms of its timing overall. It seems to be driven by actually the sea surface temperatures the prior winter, and so it seems like colder winters and some kind of winter severity seem to be driving. Um, a, a, the, the, the run um, to, uh, to be either earlier or later in the, in the season. Uh, moving earlier under uh, warmer, uh, warmer conditions. We also see an, an impact of latitude, which I think makes sense. Runs occur earlier in the south than they do in the north. Um, and it was, but it was important to capture that. And we also see that there's an impact of the annual run size on, um, on that, on the, the timing of that count. And so um, it's, it appears that it's important to sort of, the, long, the more population you have, the, the, that's also going to influence um, that run. So with warming, we might anticipate that the runs will occur earlier, um, but we'll, we'll see. Um, there are also impacts that sort of follow through in terms of the median and the end, but what we see is that winter severity becomes less important and instead you start seeing spring 
impacts. And the spring transition date is sort of the, is the date at which um, the mean temperatures in the ocean are, are, are crossed. So it sort of defines when you're above average warmth and um, below average warmth and as sort of a seasonal transition in the spring and the fall. If you have any other questions about that, I'll be happy to ask, uh, answer them afterwards. And then the end of the run seems to be driven by a lot of things and we're probably not fully capturing all of the dynamics in terms of precipitation and flow rates that are gonna be really important here. We already knew that this was um, gonna be the case because we had done um, a, uh, with Michelle Stoggenger leading it, a synthesis of, um, of sort of changes in phenology of multiple organisms in the Northeast um, ecosystem in the Gulf of Maine. And we see that um, if you look sort of in that sea category, that alewife and salmon, um, these anadromous fish seem to be moving um, earlier in the season. Um, and so, but I think the important thing here to see is that not everything is moving. These are actually the only scientifically determined changes that have been shown in the literature. And so what we know is that Number one, we do not know very much about what's going on in regards to temperature. Number two is that there's a highly variable response depending on the species, the taxonomic level, um, and what impact, what things they're, they're following as their cues. And this leads to the, ch the potential for what we call mismatches, where let's say river herring arrive really early to the fresh water, and because they're there really early, um, they're either um, impacted by uh, dredging activity or they get into the ponds and the ponds are still completely frozen over. And so you can kind of imagine, uh, and their food source isn't ready. Um, so you can kind of imagine that you might, might be leading to mismatches if the organisms that are in the ecosystem are, are actually responding in different ways to, to climate change. So that's all I have to say about this, but it's an area that we're really interested in terms of that run and how that's affecting predators and their, um, and their use of river herring as a prey species. So I'm gonna move into the next sort of stage of their life cycle. Uh, one of the things that we really thought was important when we started doing this work was to understand what was happening during this juvenile life stage in um, systems like the Mystic, um, like the Mystic Lakes. And so we de deploy this pelagic pursing, and it's uh, large and um, heavy to move. Um, so here we have a team uh, uh, deploying. You deploy it in a circle. You pull um, the uh, line, and that line basically acts like a giant um, purse and uh, captures all the fish in the in a um, in the volume of the net. And then you pull the net to the to the boat. The water goes out the holes in the net, and you're left with a collection of fish, which you can count and release and then measure a subset, which is what we did. Unfortunately, we have to do this at night. So if you've ever seen lights out in the middle of Mystic Lake, Upper Mystic Lake um, during the winter, uh, sorry, during the nighttime in the summer, um, and they seem to be doing something very strange, this is pro it's probably us. Um, so here are, so you can see some river herring that sort of in that middle panel and the lower panel, um, we're able to look at those fish, um, take samples, and then, um, and then release the rest and get a measure of how many fish there are, and uh, eventually a measure of their, um, their sizes. Their sizes on the spot actually also measure, measure 30 from each toe. Uh, we sample all summer. We do random samples throughout the, the locations. We, we did some testing to figure out when would be the best to sample. And I'll just say that if this log density, which is sort of just how many fish there are, you get the highest numbers earlier in the year in June and July. And then, um, and really you get the most fish in the month of July. And uh, that's our favorite month. And we're really hoping we're able to get out and sample a little bit this year. Um, so this is Matt Devine's work published a couple of years ago. Um, the other thing we get is, uh, is hatch dates. Um, and so what we do is we remove an otolith, which is a small ear bone that's located in all of these fish. And you can put it under a microscope and just as easily as I'm saying, you can count the rings on that, on that um, ear bone and find out how many days old that fish is. If you know how many days old it is, you know when it was hatched. And then if you know how fast it takes animals to hatch at a certain temperature, and you can make some estimates of that, you can figure out exactly when it spawned. And so we take this information to turn into hatch date and then eventually into the spawn date, um, which is here for the Mystic River, uh, Mystic uh, River and Lakes. 
showing that in fact we are as we are determining that there's some spawning that's occurring before the migration is counted and so it's just something to bear in mind that we're noticing um, in our data is um, and i'm going to come back to this in a second is that this spawning time seems to be a great indicator of when the run is actually occurring and we know it's going to be different from year to year um, so just so you know, the migrations and all of our sites are, are, are measured by these, these video, visual, or electronic counters, and the hatch dates, the spawn dates are all estimated from our otoliths. So now what we see is sort of this cumulative probability, which is just that as you go towards one, you get to all of the fish, either observed in the counting stations or observed in the, um, in the numbers of that, that were um, estimated at those dates through, through their otoliths. And what you see is that um, we are seeing spawning of these fish occurring or very early, seems to be in a couple of peaks actually, probably associated with the transition from alewife to blueback. But we have a lot of work to do on this. And um, this is just one of the figures that uh, Matt Devine gave me in the last uh, week. Um, so I've spent some time thinking about it, but haven't uh, really come to much of a conclusion beyond that. Julian Rossett uh, published a uh, um, some uh, uh, had a publication a couple of years ago that did that same process I just showed you, but for multiple different systems. You'll see that upper and lower Mystic Lake are at the bottom. Um, what we have here is the gray bars are the length of time of the spawning run, and the black lines are when the spawning occurred um, based on our otoliths. And what you'll see is that in this year, there was a really big delay in the Mystic Lakes between the run and the actual spawning which appears to me at least different from what I just showed you. And so one of the things that we're really focused on is trying to understand what, what drives that, what makes the run and the timing of spawning and the difference in length of time between these two change from year to year. And we're guessing that a big part of this is the change in temperature over the spring from, this, from these winter conditions to these spring conditions and how quickly and how, um, how quickly it occurs. Um, but this is just um, speculation at this point. I really, um, we just know that that spawning um, occurs after the run starts, as you would seem to require. Um, sometimes it, it appears to occur a lot later in the year than it does in other years. And we also, in this year, had uh, spawning well into uh, well into the summer. In fact, um, July fourth, um, there was still spawning going on in the Mystic Lakes, which is um, kind of interesting, actually, very late. Um, and so. One of the other things I wanted to point out while I'm here is that the Mystic Lakes are their own lake. They are very different from these other systems. And, um, and each system has a population of fish that appear to be somewhat different in terms of their timing. There are some similarities across lakes, but generally they're, they're all different. And the, the physical, um, the actual physical structure of the, each of these systems um, from Mystic down to, um, to Robbins Pond and, or Billington Sea, they're, they're really different systems. And these river herring have adapted in some cases or been stocked in others into these locations and sort of, and, and become sort of cued with the, with the conditions that are in those, in those systems. And so this leads to us thinking that many restoration and other activities are gonna to have to be different across different locations because they all face their own suite of both climate and potential climate impacts, but then also have these river herring which are probably acting differently as well. And so that's just something to bear in mind. Um, there's probably something that's drawing, drawing people's eye which is these small little square boxes um, across Pentucket Pond. Pentucket is a, a system that we've uh, collaboratively with the Division of Marine Fisheries actually added fish to, adult fish. And so those were the days they were and I could talk to more, more about that um, if you have questions. So this is great. We get a lot of information about spawning, but we also get information about the, um, the, the densities and numbers of fish and how big they are. And so what you see here is in Upper Mystic, the fish growing up um, throughout the year. And so we can get information about growth rates. And then of course, over the years, we also have different lengths or different densities that we can see in our, in our studies. And I, I was gonna put the density figure up either but it's just to point out that through these monitoring programs, we can sort of understand the growth and patterns in, in, in these fish. And the real holy grail of what we're trying to do here is then compare the results of these interannual changes to 
conditions such as the number of spawners, the temperature, and other things that are going on in these systems. So we've been very happy with this uh, with this effort on um, with the juvenile uh, index of abundance, we like to call it, or um, our Persane survey, to try and understand more than just the number of fish that are running through um, spawning uh, these uh, counting operations um, across the state, and really trying to bring more information to the table, not competing information, just so we understand fully um, the uh, wide range of impacts and things that occur. Um, over their life cycle. And we're hoping that that will lead to a better understanding of those populations. We're also really lucky. Uh, Leon has been doing uh, temperature studies in the lab. And so in 2017, we actually took fish from Mystic uh, Lakes and moved them to the Cronin uh, State uh, Center that's just north of the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And Leon moved them into these tanks and uh, exposed them to a different temperature and different amount of food. And so what you're seeing at the bottom is the temperature in degrees Celsius, so 21 degrees and 2% of their body weight in terms of food. So they're getting fed 21 degrees, 2% uh, of their body uh, weight at 21 degrees. And then you can see that there's a 21 degree and 1%, 25 degree and 2%, 25 degree and 1%. So there's a low and a high food and uh, low and a high temperature. What I show in the bars is their total weight over the three sample times, okay? So at the beginning of the trial, at the end, of, at the middle, and at the end of the trial. And so what you see uh, is that, as you would expect, the fish are getting bigger. As time goes on, we're feeding them nicely. But the question was, is there an impact of the food level and is there an impact of the temperature in terms of how this growth is uh, occurs. And I really am not gonna spend a lot of time on this because Leon is working on it right now and I don't wanna steal her thunder. So this is the only slide I'm gonna show. She has a really interesting study looking at a number of factors, including uh, the condition of those fish, how much fat they're putting on. And um, I think it's a really going to be a number of interesting stories, both from river herring, um, from alewife, uh, alewife in, in this system, but also from uh, blueback herring in the uh, Connecticut River, where a lot of our work has occurred. So the results are that as you increase the temperature and decrease the food, the growth goes down. And so what we're seeing is that as food, as the temperature increases, you need more food to be able to compensate for the increased needs of that organism living in that temperature. Fish are a cold-blooded organism, or poikilothermic is the other word that's used by scientists. That basically means that their body temperature changes according to the temperature of the water around them. And it makes sense. They're breathing through their gills, and their gills are in intimate contact with that water, and therefore they become very quickly the same temperature as that water. So if the, as the temperature goes up, their bodies increase in temperature, and therefore they need, they actually burn more energy and require more food. And so the subtle balance between the temperature and how much food is going to be a huge part of how well these fish do in the future of climate change. If more food becomes available in these systems or we're able to spread them out across larger areas so that they're not competing so much with each other, it's very likely that they'll do well. If they're however constrained by the amount of food that's in these systems, they're probably not going to do well. And I'll end this section by saying that in our opinion, it looks like as you uh, creep over the temperature of 25 degrees, that there's gonna be an additional burden on these fish um, in terms of achieving their, 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 their needed sizes. And as you get to that highest um, temperature and lowest food ration on the far right of this figure, you see that really the fish are, har are hardly growing at all. And in fact, these are, this would be a concern if, if, um, if food was not enough to compensate for that increase in temperature, you could have fish that were really not growing and um, I think everybody can understand that if that was the case, it would be a problem. So while this is occurring, obviously the fish are leaving these systems and moving into the estuary. We're extremely fortunate to receive funding from Woods Hole Sea Grant to ask questions about what's going on around there. And we're really excited that the Mystic River Watershed Association was one of those that was going to partner with us in this effort. And so in a nutshell, what we're going to do is study these three systems, Chebacco Lake and Essex Bay, 
um, Mystic Lakes and the Mystic River um, Estuary and Whitman's Pond in the Weymouth Back River Estuary. The idea is that we will sample fish using our Hersane method and probably others from each of the freshwater river and estuarine environments to understand their growth and survival across these, uh, these locations. If they are composed of the same individuals that are making movements, are there the individuals that leave earlier that are making up um, are larger? What, it, what is it that's making these fish move out of these systems? What happens if they get caught by a drought? Are there conditions that are bad for their movement into the estuary? Um, these are things that we just don't know. And so um, we're really excited to do this work. And we think that this is going to provide a great opportunity for us to do, um, to do really understand much more about the life history of this, of, of this species. So we're really excited about this funding. This is going to continue for us into the, into the next uh, couple of years. It was supposed to start this year, but obviously um, it's a different year than, uh, norm than normal years. And why this is important is uh, well pointed out in a paper that came out by Gary Nelson. And, and, and you know, he, he likes a really quite complicated model, but it's a very effective model to try and understand how things are driving these, um, these populations. So we have sort of a fish moving from eggs in the B panel over there all the way to the getting out in the river, and then they go into the ocean and there's an ocean phase. I don't want to get bogged down in the details of this other than to point out, um, well, a couple of things. First of all, that one of the things you find when you do this is the missing data and we're really missing a knowledge about the estuary residents of this fish of these fish um just really uh poor really poor information about younger year survival or juvenile survival in general the other thing is temperature shows up all over the place in this in this uh, model and i uh, also just noticed that there was um rainfall as well there uh, in the b panel so there's a lot of places where climate change are going to impact these species all right, at the end of this talk, I'm going to move into probably my favorite thing, um, which is ecosystems. And I've, I've been st starting my ecosystem uh, talks oops, by, uh, by saying that I've, I like to think of ecosystems as functioning like a relay race. And that is that if the river herring move nicely into these systems and they can pass on, they can eat a piece of food and then they can move out into the ocean and something can eat them and they get sort of passed along in a perfect way, Great. But the problem is that there are a lot of things that are going to impede that in terms of, um, and many of them are because of us. And so when you have these mismatches, as I mentioned earlier, you can have a disconnection of that ecosystem and actually impact the way that we finally get that food at the end of the day. This cost them the gold medal, by the way. Um, we've done that with dams. So this is the Nature Conservancy dam database that just demonstrates the widespread nature of our impacts on the on anadromous species. I've had students who've worked on this showing that our, the populations of these fish, and at least if you use the amount of habitat as, as, a, as a metric of how many fish there are, have declined precipitously. And if you look at sort of Southern New England and the regional averages over here, we're looking at about 10, five to five to 10% of the habitat remaining. And these have profound impacts on the numbers of fish in this paper by Stephen, he then surmised how many fish would be lost every year. And this is very conservative estimates, you know, 18 million fish lost um, from um, just uh, three systems, uh, whatever, a few, only a few systems. And, uh, you know, we've done this across the entire landscape, it, but it does speak to the potential for restoration. And so I, I wanna leave this part of, of the talk with that. These fish, however, then go into, into freshwater ecosystems and they are both they are key conduit. They eat zooplankton and they are consumed by predators. And so we've, we've done studies looking at how they can structure the ecosystem beneath them. Um, and I'm not gonna get into the details of this slide other than to say that um, they can change the sizes of zooplankton that are present. And, um, and the study was done, one of the study sites was the Mystic Lakes. We also see that they um, show up in the diets of almost every predatory fish in these systems. And that in the system, in the fish that you have, can get enough data, um, in this case, white perch, you can see that in June, early in the year, when there are tons of them and they're very small, that they are actually increasing the condition of these fish. Um, the rest of the story is much more complicated. I'll just leave it by saying that, um, that these impacts appear to change the growth of some of these species such that they actually, um, for white perch, achieve a very slight 
Biologically, are fisheries important change in size, but they are a little smaller in, in ponds with alewife present um, because probably they're investing a lot of energy and growth and therefore achieve maturity actually uh, faster. Very preliminary um, sort of look at this. I think you'd have to study a lot more systems and do a lot more work. Um, but we're really interested also in what happens in the ocean. You know, these fish then leave based on timing of flow out or other conditions. And so they interact with many other species um, in, the, in, the, in the ecosystem. And this is work by my graduate student, Bia Diaz, who has created an ecosystem model. You can see this a little allocene blip there. We'd like to make that bigger, probably never as big as Atlantic herring. They're an important conduit of the energy that's low in the food web from phytoplankton and other sources and up through to the things that we care about in terms of fisheries or the things that we really like, like sharks and um, cod. But as I mentioned earlier, and this is a really messy slide I'm about to show you, um, and I don't have time to go through all of it, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things. So first of all, the sea surface is uh, changing and this is impacting the oceanography, it's impacting the nutrients, it's changing the way that the phytoplankton operate. The zooplankton are obviously impacted by this in different ways. And then there are a series of seasonal strategies where fish make emigration and immigration from different areas in order to complete growth and survival um, spawning. And um, just so you know, the seasonal strategy um, down here is sort of in the, in the alewife um, uh, river herring world um, where you start getting impacted by that river outflow as well. And the connection amongst all of these is what, is, what, is what gives me the greatest sort of worry and concern is that we don't understand how all of these components fit together. Because our food web right now has a lot of cold water species and we're likely to have those potentially change over. And so I think it's a great question over what our future ecosystems are gonna look like as cod is replaced by black sea bass, as lobsters are replaced by blue crabs and as um, different copepods and different sharks and different predators move into the system. It's gonna look different. So we're missing a lot of information to really tie this all together. Um, we feel like we have a lot more work to do on the freshwater productivity, the juvenile recruitment, in linking these life stages to each other. The estuary data is really key. I'd love to get to a point where we're linking our marine ecosystem models to freshwater ecosystem models and understanding what, what happens in each and how it impacts the other. And then we have still work to do on our climate induced ships and phenology and rain, uh, rain ships because uh, species are, are moving um, to, to compensate for these changes in temperature. And we have a lot of work to do in, the, in those realms as well. And then of course, there's how they're connected to each other um, through those ecosystem models. And then I'm gonna end with just a last a couple of thoughts. One of them is that I find river herring the complete paradox. They are the species that is in this uh, upper high biological sensitivity and high climate exposure, very high, high. They're, at, they're viewed as at risk from climate change, but both species are found throughout much of the United States southern uh, eastern coast, including down into southern states. And so how is a species that is so widely distributed like this more susceptible than species that I view as being much more constrained to the northeast? And so I'm not saying John Hare is wrong. I'm just saying that this is a really interesting area to me. And I think that we have a lot to understand in terms of how our actions are going to either allow the recovery and maintenance of uh, river herring populations, or they're gonna be exposed and sensitive to these changes and we're gonna lose more populations um, in the future. So I think we still have lots to learn. Um, our solutions, I think are really simple. Continue increasing their habitat. Don't stop at horn pond continue going, finding new systems that can support them. Not only because we may lose some of the advantages of, uh, of some of our low coastal lakes as they potentially become inundated by, um, by uh, estuarine and, and marine waters, but also because the one thing for sure is if you want more river herring, you give them more habitat, you create more systems that can support them. Then you monitor them and you understand how they're changing with the, cha with the changing uh, climate and with, our, with the things that we're doing in terms of fishways, in terms of dam removals. And then you take that information and you adapt your management strategies to make it more 
uh, make these populations more uh, resilient to these changes in the future. So I encourage you to stay tuned for more work in the next few years. And if you see our team out there, I'd normally encourage you to come over and talk to us. But for this one here, I'm going to ask that you please give us the space. Um, and I hope that our, our team will be able to continue to report out to you guys in, um, in this forum, hopefully in the person uh, in, in person in the future. Um, so I'd like to ask you all to stay safe and, and say thank you for listening and just end with this uh, wonderful slide of our planet. And uh, uh, thank you for, for your attention. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Jordan. I think we do have a few questions. Uh, the first one is more climate related and then a lot of these are herring related. Uh, so do marine heat waves relate to air or water? Yeah, so it's a water temperature thing, mm -hmm. but it's, good, it's helpful to think of it from the terrestrial thing. It's basically when temperature, water temperatures or ocean temperatures exceed some number that has been determined to be mm. indicating a heat wave. Mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they are actually based on ocean temperatures. And, the, and it's really complicated how that works <laughs> because mm -hmm. oceanography is not just heating from the, from the sun. It's actually a complex mi mix of oceanographic patterns and that's a whole lecture in itself. Great, thank you. All right, another one has, um, has an incipient lethal temperature for juvenile herring been established in the wild? So I, I think the short answer to that is no. Um, there has been some work done, um, but there has not been a lot on, on the upper actual lethal limits for river herring. Um, and there certainly hasn't in our area. And in fact, I think that I, I get really concerned when people apply even information from one system to everywhere. Um, something that I'm sure one of my colleagues would say I'm guilty of occasionally. But, um, but I think that, the, that this is a very system specific question. Um, and certainly, are you talking about alewife or blueback? Blueback seem to be more resilient to, to these, these changes um, because they're a slightly warmer water species than alewife coming a little later in the season in terms of the run. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that's actually the case. Um, so there's still, there's, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's something that my graduate student Leon is, is mm -hmm. trying to answer. Um, we probably won't do so much in the way of actual lethal temperatures. We're probably more interested actually the, the temperatures will be lethal to the population far before they're actually lethal in terms of the death of that indivi mm. uh, death of individuals. Thank you. So you just touched on this one a little bit, but are is there a difference between the um, blueback and alewife when it comes to climate change impact? Yeah, so that's also, again, you know, <laughs> like I keep saying, like we don't know a ton about these species. So I'll just say that what we do know is basically what I just said, that uh, mm -hmm. bluebacks are a little bit warmer mm -hmm. water species compared to alewife. Um, I would say that my graduate student has been generally surprised, Leon has been generally su surprised by their ability to grow and temperatures that have been suggested in other literature to be exceeding their, um, their, their, the temperatures they should be able to do okay in. Um, but I think there's a real big difference between growing a tiny little bit, growing well, and what that means to those populations. So in general, in general, blueback will probably do better in a climate, in a warming world than alewife will, but mm. both species extend far, like well, well down into the chest, past the Chesapeake. So mm. ultimately, if that, if that genetic material can get here, so that's a big question as to whether they're adapted to different temperatures. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Um, we don't know if there are things that will, if the populations here need like need to adapt or whether populations will move in from other places. We don't know that for almost any species. And so these are really big open questions. You know, the advantage that we have with these species is they do seem to spray. So they seem to go to a, a closed system to them. And they also do seem to uh, mix in the ocean a lot. And so there's the potential that they will adapt in their own way to these changing uh, temperatures, but there's also, <laughs> there's also a chance that they would. So mm -hmm. um, information to, to, to come for sure. And my student, uh, Leon, again, has, uh, has intentions this summer of completing a comparison between the two species side by side to really answer that question better. Oh, wow, that'll be really interesting. And I think we have time for maybe two more. And I have a few people asking, what are the main predators of river herring? Um, so I've always joked that they're the hot dogs of the sea. That pretty much everything will eat them. 
Um, they, uh, we see them in the diets of um, many important um, commercial species like striped bass. Um, but there's been a number of studies that will show basically anything will eat them that, that eats herring. So um, if, if you can picture, I mean, almost every fish eating fish, piscopore, will, will, eat, will eat herring. And so the question is, can you even yeah. see alewife or blueback in the stomachs of these hmm. marine predators when they're such a small number in terms of how many, you th I know they look like a lot in a river, but they're just nothing in the ocean. They're very, very small numbers compared to things like Atlantic herring. And so we see them in the stomachs of many, many different predators. But the question would be, if they were three or four times the number now, would that still improve? And so my student, Bia Diaz, uh, produced an ecosystem model and actually asked questions like that. And so if people are interested, they can look up Diaz opening the tap and they can find a paper in uh, PLOS One that, that asks uh, many of those uh, questions. And I, I encourage you to look at that if, if you want more information about what is eating them. But it's a wide range of species from seabirds to um, um, to predator to many predator uh, fish. Thank you. And our last one: Do we know as river herring travel further nor north in the ocean because of climate change, how it will impact their ability to return to natal waters? Yeah. So. Um, I always lament the lost grant proposals that didn't get funded. Uh, we had one years ago now that um, really wanted to dig in on where they were moving in the ocean, but it was a lot of money and they were not listed. <laughs> um, so we didn't get that money. We, we unfortunately do not know anything about, really anything about their marine, mo mo their marine movements. Um, we have spotty information from certain surveys showing where they are, but we don't know what those populations are from. So I'm just gonna, so I always think of this guy, Irv Cornfield, a, a, a faculty at UMaine when I was there, who had this hand, weird hand, robotic hand, and he would, he would make it make different noises during presentations if he was saying something that was completely based on no fact, just an opinion, or based on scientific fact. So some, I feel like I would, I'd like to have that sometimes. So my opinion is that uh, with almost no information, is that there's a lot of mixing of these populations. They probably, it looks like from the very limited tagging data, they all go north after their, after their move back out into the ocean. And there seems to be a really important area up in the Bay of Fundy for over summer feeding. Um, and there's fish from down south that were tagged in a study by Roger Rolofson way back in the day um, that showed that actually those fish were moving all the way up to the Bay of Fundy. So wow. there's not a lot of information showing how individual populations are shifting where they are. There is some information showing that they have shifted their range from the National Marine Fisheries Trawl Survey data set. Um, that's worked by Janet Nye. That shows that, um, that the, those fish have, have slightly shifted their ranges, um, but, but that's just the whole population based on being, you know, being caught in the ocean. They weren't assigned to rivers. So we don't understand that, that part of their uh, lives really at all. I would say that that is a complete uh, lack of knowledge. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Jordan. I know this this whole um, group here, I see a lot of names I'm familiar with, and they're really, we really care about river herring, and this information is fascinating. So I appreciate your time. Well, I'd like to thank you for, for having me and, and, and encourage people not to necessarily send 50, me 50 emails tonight, um, but uh, certainly if you have questions that you want to follow up with, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to either just have a Q&A in a future meeting awesome. or, we can, or you can send me emails. Um, tomorrow I have a lot of email catch up though, so maybe wait until- We'll, we'll hold off for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. um, but thank you to, uh, to Mystic River Watershed Association, to you, Erica, and to everybody for your interest in this uh, wonderful and elusive uh, fish. Yes, thank you so much. And for anyone who is um, attending the policy committee meeting, there is a, um, a link to the meeting and an email that I sent out earlier today. And I will put that in the chat now, actually. For everyone else who um, is joining us today, just wanna say thank you for attending. And I will post the link to the committee meeting right now. All right, everyone, take care.